Okay, so today we're covering the history of life, part one. Um, one thing I forgot to mention in our intro, so we're covering a huge range of topics, and for some of them, some of you might, might know more than I do, right? So we get to sort of fungus phylogeny, the people here who's like, their career is studying fungus phylogeny, right? So if something comes up and you know something better than I do, speak up, it's okay, right? I'm going to make sure the information delivered is the best possible, so don't be shy. So first, the learning outcomes for today, what's the point of today's class? One, I want to get a deep perspective on time, okay, um, so we're just going to a big overview of the entire history of life and prehistory of that. I want to understand some of the major events in Earth history, and I want to also start to start generating hypotheses about what happens after mass extinctions, okay. Um, and again, note my slides will be PDFs online and also on YouTube. Um, the way I lecture, I typically have images, but not a ton of bullet points for you to copy. It's going to be some of the last bullet points you see. Okay, so you, know, you might suggest how you take notes. Okay, but if you have questions, let me know. <coughs> so, Big Bang, thirteen point seven three billion years ago. Okay, so immediately after, so you know, single point, inflation, little quantum fluctuations happening, and that sort of quantum fluctuations led to lumpiness, which led to things like galaxies. Okay. <coughs> it's dark, and then the stars coalesced, started burning. Okay, some of those stars burned out. Nebula came back together, supernova came back together, new stars again, so forth. Okay, and here we are here. Okay. And this right here is something cool. So people originally thought that the universe was static. People realize that things are moving away from us, and thought that, okay, well, at some point it's going to be slowing down as it moves away, right? Because the attraction is gravity is pulling it back. But now we see it's actually expanding faster and faster. And it's thought to be some sort of dark energy caused acceleration. And then physics is now trying to figure out what's going on here. <coughs> so, that's cool, lots of cool science there. Okay, so at first, most of the atoms were hydrogen and some helium. Okay. And then inside stars, stars use nuclear energy, right? But they're doing nuclear fusion rather than fission. Right? It's fusing things. And so things like carbon, which is actually pretty common in the universe now, they're usually very rare. But deep inside stars that are getting sort of middle aged, you would have sometimes two helium atoms combined and fuse into beryllium which quickly breaks apart again. But if it's very lucky, sometimes before it breaks apart, another helium hits. It's almost a three-way reaction and creates carbon, which is unstable, right? <coughs> so that's inside a star. How does it get inside you? Yep, right. The star explodes, all the particles, and then eventually go back together, form a new solar system. Good. And so it's happened with us. So our solar system and planets formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Okay. And I'm not going to, I mean, it's good to know the dates, but I'm going to say, okay, was it 4.6 billion or 4.7 billion? Okay, we should know sort of order of magnitude how old it is. Okay. The moon was broken off from the Earth about 4.53 billion years ago. Okay. <coughs> so, you know, if life could evolve then, you know, having your entire crust vaporized, not good for life. So, I like that. Then there's a period of heavy bombardment, okay? Giant rocks hitting the Earth, you know, melting the crust, okay? This actually isn't Earth, this is actually Mimas, the moon of Saturn, but get the idea. <coughs> okay? So, continue crashing, you know, things impacting, then it starts slowing down, right? Is it done? No, I mean, look at Russia last year, right? We still have things hitting, but a lot less frequent, okay? Almost as soon as that ended, life evolves, okay? These are having evidence for early life, okay? And here are some slightly later life stromatolites. Okay. We have really old fossils from, actually some are still living today. Any questions so far?
and photosynthesis evolves. Okay, why is this important? Change the atmosphere. Good. We're going to get to the next slide. Excellent. What else? There's oxygen, right? Why is that? Why is that useful? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I think it makes metabolism a lot more efficient, right? So when you're running, right, and your legs start to burn, you don't work as well, right? Well, that's why you've stopped using oxygen, and you're now just using um, anaerobic respiration, right? Which is not nearly as efficient. I mean, so you slow down. Okay. In theory, I don't run that much. That's what happens, right? So <coughs> oxygen allows you to have bigger energetic organisms. Okay. What else is is important for early Earth? <clears throat> what do things need to survive? Food, Food right? And, and then, yep, exactly. Um, we think so. You need you need some way to have energy, right? So at first, you can make a living by if you're the first life form and you're just filling this soup of all this nice, yummy stuff that no one else knows how to eat. Great. Right? Once that's used up, what are you going to do? Right? Well, you can start eating others, that's going to run out. Right? So you have some other source of energy. And so photosynthesis is one such source. What's another source? Not quite. It happens at geothermal like vents and stuff, but it's not, it's not, it's not from the heat itself. Yep, chemosynthesis, right? It was only discovered. Um, are we are we out of chairs? Yeah. There's there's one more chair. There's some more chairs in the break room right down the hall. Um, right. So there's chemosynthesis, right? Where you take energy from chemicals and do reduction redox, redox reactions on those. Okay. And that happens at hot fats. So you've seen pictures of those tube worms. Right? What those are doing, those are hosting bacteria that can do that chemical reaction. Okay? <coughs> and get energy that way. And so, first thing is photosynthesis, but now, the, the, you know, people didn't discover chemosynthesis until I think it was the 70s. It was a very re recent discovery. Okay? And so now there's a question was early life first photosynthetic or chemosynthetic? Okay. okay. So, <coughs> these cute little photosynthetic things were the first mass polluters. Right. So sugar, yay. Oxygen. We think yay, right? Let's just let's just respire, use energy more efficiently, right? What does oxygen do? Oxidizes. Right. So rust things, right? So <coughs> it also destroys Chemical, I mean, through oxidation, destroys things, right? So right now, your DNA is being degraded by the oxygen in your cells. Hold your breath, right? I mean, so we've evolved mechanisms to repair that, right? And to prevent oxidation from happening too much in our bodies. <coughs> but many life forms couldn't evolve that. And so they actually can only live in oxygen-free environments. They're anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria, things like that. Okay? Because oxygen is this nasty gas. Okay. There's actually a science fiction story at one point where aliens flew by the Earth and didn't stop because, oh, that has oxygen-rich atmosphere. Nothing can evolve under oxygen to react to it. We know that doesn't happen, but you know, it just shows how reactive oxygen can be. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, Huronian glaciation. Okay, so now we know global warming is a problem, right? And there's lots of evidence that shows it is. In the past, though, there is this issue of global cooling. And so it could have been the entire planet was covered with ice. It could have been the entire planet except for the slushy middle on the equator. Um, but a huge proportion of the Earth's surface was frozen. Okay? <coughs> and this lasted for, you know, almost a billion years. So a very long time. Okay? 
Some thought some think it could be due to oxygen reacting with methane in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Methane's a greenhouse <clears throat> gas. If you destroy the greenhouse gas, yay for us now. Back then, it cools everything down. Right? That's one hypothesis. Okay? We still don't know completely what caused like, this glaciation. Um, it's thought that what helped us escape this was volcanoes belching out carbon dioxide, which is greenhouse gas, yay, warms the earth. Okay? And melts the ice. Then, and I'm sorry for those of you who are like in BCMB or MCB who like bacteria, nothing much happened for a long time. Okay? Um, <coughs> right? So, solar system, right? Light starts forming, right? Um, we get a divergence of archaea and eukaryotes from eubacteria. Okay? Here. Is divergence from euk eukaryotes, okay, and life is still all single-celled in this period. Here, here. Right, so all this long period, life is single-celled. Any hypothesis about why that might be? Yep. So if you're, if you're small and have short-lived short -lived organisms, you can adapt faster, right? Why else? <coughs> why, why, why might it be hard to evolve multicellularity? There's not much advantage to it if everything's covered by such thick ice. Okay. There's you know, no real resources to be gained. Well, well, I mean... And what I'll often do with students is argue, even if you're, I think you're right, just to, you know. So, but I mean, you could argue that you have, you know, say, bacterial mass or stromatolites. You know, if you're, if you're bigger, you could, like, chomp on them, right? Maybe. I mean, if you're still eating single-celled organisms, you have to eat Mm-hmm. Yep. That's right, you could just be bigger. Yeah, and I actually have found some huge... Huge cells now that you can actually see with your naked eye. I didn't know if I'm about a virus that you can see with your naked eye. It came out a few months ago in science. All right. What else? Mm hmm. Yep. All right. And you also you can get things, you have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, so you can get things over your cell membrane. Whereas us, we have to have this whole, whole lab, like lung apparatus to get oxygen. If we're single celled, we're small, it's oxygen diffuse. Think about evolutionary pressures. Right? So take my hand cells, right? Are they happy to be in my body? Are they going to have offspring? I hope not. Right? <laughs> um, so the cells in my hand are a dead end. Right? So the, I only have a few cells that might go on to, to let, leave offspring, right? All the, rest of my, all the rest of my cells are going to die off, right? So if you have all these other organisms, you have some of them, some, some of the, you know, let's say we have two of them joined together, okay, I'll have babies, you'll do the, you'll do the eating, okay, but I'll have no, I'll have no offspring, so that's something selected against, right? So this natural conflict, okay? And so we'll talk later on in the semester about how that concept seems to be, you know, how, how, what, can, what can sort of lead to getting around that conflict, right? But it is a big evolutionary pressure. How do you have these two things that have different um, incentives working together, right? <coughs> um, actually, one, one cool example of sort of hand cells that could survive and reproduce actually it's muzzle cells um, in Tasmanian devils now, they have an infectious cancer. And so the cancer goes from animal to animal and spreads through different animals. So normally you can't catch cancer from other people, right? In this case, they're so genetically related that the cancer cells can survive in other hosts. And so cancer, those cells become diseased and spread through the population. Kind of cool evolution. Really bad for them. 
Okay. And so here's the basal splits. So bacteria, which is what I usually call eubacteria nowadays, archaea and eukarya. Okay. And this is a phylogeny. And we'll come back to this later on. But the things to be able to look, do with phylogeny is, first of all, these groupings. So archaea and eukarya share all this history together. Okay. And so they have all these to make them more each share derived traits and well, yeah. And so they're more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria. Okay. Even if you know, these are single cell, these are single cell, these are multi cell, right? But these still share more history, so more closely related. Okay. And archaea and bacteria also have much more diversity. Right? Same bacteria, I heard about various <coughs> other archaea, archaea, right? And, you know, um, you've got to figure out what's going to eat in a caucus, so called lapis. All right, and here's how they compare. So circular chromosome, bacteria and archaea have it, eukaryotes don't. Histones, wrap the DNA around, we share that with archaea. Flagella, Spinning or waving, right? They have spinning, we have waving. Unicellular, yes, yes, and varies. And organelles, almost no, there's a little question. No, and yes. Okay. And we'll figure out how we got some of our organelles later. It's kind of a very cool story. Okay, here's a short discovery, here's a short video about the discovery of archaea. So one of the hundred greatest discoveries. More than a century after the discovery of the cell nucleus, it was believed there were two fundamental types of life on Earth, bacteria and everything else. Bacteria were classified as prokaryotes. These were simple, single-celled organisms with their DNA contained not within a nucleus, but by the cell wall. All other life forms were classified as eukaryotes, their cells carry their DNA enclosed within the nucleus. But this simple classification system was in for a shock. In 1977, biologist Carl Woese was studying the genetic makeup of a methane-producing microbe when he realized it was different from any known bacteria. Its cell wall was unique. It produced unusual enzymes and its genetic sequence was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It became soon apparent within the, within the scope of the space of an hour that there was, there was something, a third thing out there. This was the moment of discovery. Carl Woese had found a third form of life, a group of single-celled organisms that he called archaea. We used to think there were two primary kingdoms on this planet. Now we know there are three. That was the shift, big shift. Because all of microbiology had been structured around the idea that all bacteria are fundamentally the same. Not in their details, but in their essence, their ancestry and their basic cell organization. Here is something that every microbiologist and biologist firmly believed in, and it wasn't true. So it does make you smile, doesn't it? Yeah. Look what I found. <laughs> you guys were wrong. But that's how science works, right? I mean, so science isn't about, like, learning facts. I mean, it is when you're, you know, in high school and stuff. But at the level you guys are at in, in the future, it's about finding what we know and then going to find a new part of something we don't know and discovering that. And it could be that something we know was wrong and then we fix it. But that's what this joy of scientific discovery. You're always testing new ideas and trying to trash old ones and seeing, you know, what, do, what does nature show us? And so, <coughs> and a pretty fundamental discovery, too, that happened fairly recently. I mean, 77, and most of you probably weren't born then. I wasn't born then. But still, you know, it is very recent for discovering, oh yeah, there's a third of life we've missed. Right? So, cool. Okay. So, now I'll get to multicellular organisms. The fast, the furious. Eddie Karens, right? And <coughs> well, I still qu don't quite know what these are. So this is fauna of these 
we're going to be sort of like this. And we don't know where they throw synthetic, where they, they fall around. We don't really know much about them. Okay. Um, this is an active area of research, of course. Um, we also have trace fossils of burrows of things moving. Okay. So we know that there were, after that, so they know that there were some stuff moving through, moving through and having in motion. Okay. After that, we have the Cambrian explosion. And <coughs> this is really cool because there were evolution of hard parts. Okay. And the, the ancestor vertebrates, I mean, the ancestor vertebrates, you know, all the way back in my life, of course, but then they started to have a notochord appear here, too. Okay. And we'll talk about this more next time, but I mean, some of these organs are really cool. So this was a novel of Paris, right, who first found fossils that thought it was a human organ, but it was. This is a little bit of a shrimp like thing, it's a little sort of jellyfish thing. It's a third fossil. You can realize, oh, it's one thing, right? So this thing could go through the seas, and pick up stuff, and crush it in its circular jaws. Kim Iris. How big is it? was like five feet long or so. Yeah. Yep. So, lots of cool things. Some of the things that people call hallucinogenia, because if you have a hallucination, you look at it. <laughs> Really cool stuff, which we'll get to later. Um, it's a cool story of the discovery of these of these fossils. There's some guy riding his donkey in the in the Rockies and fell off. And this really cool fossil site. But come back to it. Okay, so Cambrian start having lots of things that can move, that can see. Right? And think about what you know, what a power of vision gives to an organism, right? Trying to sort of feeling the vision, you can now look use this use this electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic detector, and see something coming at you from far away. It's pretty cool. <coughs> okay, and then here is sort of life through that. So we have formation of the Earth, and then simple cell stuff, gasoline to sun, right? And then we have complex life evolving, right? And then we have the various time periods. Okay. And you've heard about you know, Cretaceous, back to the Triassic, dinosaur, over those. Also, lots of previous periods too, okay, and later ones. So, when life almost went extinct, so the Permian-Triassic extinction, okay, 251 million years ago. Okay, so here is a Permian organism. This would actually eat um, uh, uh, ammonites. Okay, cool, and. Permian extinction is that, right? So that fraction of life is going extinct. Right? So we're from that to that, right? So basically, life was still a rounding error at that point, right? So it could have, you know, very easy to go from, you know, four to zero. It's greater than four, but still, it's huge extinction. Okay. And I'm still trying to figure out why it happened. Okay, and the various theories we'll talk about later. Okay. Another famous extinction you may have heard about is the KT extinction. Okay, now I saw an open, those of you who saw the opening video, giant rock from space comes, hits, you have nuclear winter, you have full fires, and so forth. Okay, this wiped out ammonites, okay, which these sort of cephalopods that had these coil shells, or very cool, or long spiral shells. They also wiped out non avian dinosaurs. Right, some dinosaurs survived as birds. Um, <coughs> there were mammals before this time, and actually right now there's a fight in science about what sort of mammals there were. So if you use so the fossil evidence, the mammals are these small little insectivorous little shrew-like things, kind of insignificant. If you use molecular evidence, there's evidence for like monkeys occurring in the Cretaceous, right? And so people are still fighting about what's going on with that. I do molecular stuff, but I tend to do with the fossils in this case. I think it's just because they're really badly dating. But we'll figure, but that's something that people are actually working on right now. Because these are one of the, the things that, how science works, right? People have these wildly different ideas and they sort of fight and find out, you know, go back to the data and see which one's right. Okay, so <coughs> that's Earth's history. What's Earth's future? Okay, well, our sun will eventually become a red giant and expand. Okay, and it's not clear yet whether Earth will be, whether the rays of Earth, the orbit of Earth will be inside the red giant or just outside, either way though, it's going to be a bad time for Earth, right? <coughs> um, 
And so basically, if here's a timeline of life, life evolves here. Long time, singularity. Now, and then life is extinct. And you know, very like, like complex life will go extinct a little earlier because it can handle these well. Eventually, everything on Earth will go extinct. So, happy news for the day. <laughs> but you know, that's a long time away. But at that point, we will have you know, we'll spread like a disease to other planets. So it should probably be okay. Right. <coughs> Humans, cockroaches, and starlings on Mars would be great. Okay. So that's the last one I want to start having is have a discussion about how, how might an extinction like the end Permian affect <clears throat> life. So when you have 99% of things going extinct, what happens next? So I'm going to break into groups of three and start chatting with each other. And the reason for this, rather than having just talk, talk, talk out loud at once, is good for students sometimes to you know, practice their thoughts with other people and learn before they you know, are willing to present it to the class because you know, other people get nervous. So, groups of three. Or so. Okay, two more minutes. Okay, 30 seconds. Well, you learn, your, learn, learn your group members' names, too. Okay, good. That's what I say. Hey, you had a great thought. You know. um, 
Okay, and there's also there's a question about the reoxidation event, sort of how much oxygen, how quickly. I don't know. I'll look it up and let you know. That's good. That's a good question. All right. So, how might the major extinction have caused the end? How, how, yeah, what would be the effect of a major extinction like this? What do you think? And it'd be good if someone says something. If someone else disagrees, disagree politely. But that's what science is about. What's an, adapt what's an adaptive radiation? Mm -hmm. And the adaptive part also, they often tend to occupy different niches too. Yeah. Good. And we'll be covering that after radiations later, but that's, that's a good hypothesis. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that maybe um, if you were an organism that had a predator that was killed off in the extinction and you had already adapted and had an adaptation to escape from that predator or something and the predator was now on, then you might lose that trait. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. yep. A cool counterexample of that is pronghorn antelope. Because um, I mean, biology is a very statistical science, so like that probably happens mostly, but there's always some freaks that do something else, <laughs> right? And so pronghorns, are they live in Western North America? They have like these two horns, pronged horns, um, and they can run like 40 miles an hour, right? So it's crazy, right? And their predators can't run that fast, okay? So why evolve that with speed? Right? All you need to do, do is outrun the bear. You want to outrun it, you know, and, and make fun of it too and laugh at <laughs> it, right? <coughs> and there used to be a cheetahs in North America that went extinct. So think that they, people think that they evolved at great speed to escape from cheetahs, okay? But now what happens is when they're pairing up and mating, they sort of play tag, right? And so those that run fastest have a better chance. And so it sort of becomes a sexually selected trait for having fast speed too. Though again, maybe at some point they'll start dropping their speed. And maybe, maybe, maybe their top speed is less than it was when your life depended on it. But. Cool. <clears throat> This is that slow, that long wait time thing that makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So, and all humans. Yeah. Go. Is it, is it, So why do you think that? Okay. So um, stronger in what way? Mm -hmm. Right. So it could be you know partly it's stochastic, right? So if you know the KT extinction, if you're where the asteroid lands, your genetic quality doesn't matter, right? Um, <laughs> but if you Yeah, if you're on the edge of like survivability, you can get out. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, but the other thing to think about is the conditions that you th select for survival after. I mean, it's like we know KT bears do KT. Um, after like you have like a global winter, right? Those genes might not be the ones that help you after that. So the selection pressures can change. It's kind of interesting. So it could be that you know after the KT, there's a giant fern spike, right? Things that could live in low light and had could survive for long periods without lots of energy. But after that, now you have this, you know, once the winter dis dis dissipates, you have this sunny atmosphere, not a lot of things growing high. Maybe those that are, you know, grow fast and furious and cheaply do better than those that are sort of carefully maintaining their energy reserves. So it could be, you know, a shift in selection pressure. But it's good. It's good. Yeah. So, and back to the bottlenecks. What, what's, what's wrong with the bottleneck? Or what, what are the effects of bottlenecks? So you have fewer species. A few individuals. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
So we'll get to this later, but a bottleneck you know, reduces genetic diversity, right? So if all of humanity were us, right? I mean, it might be, you know, it might be five of us have the same recessive mutation for something bad, you know, cystic fibrosis or something. And so it might be really frequent in the population, right? And in the small population, selection is not as effective, it would be harder to purge from the population. Um, that sort of thing. Good. Okay. Um, what else? Right, yeah, so selectivity, like we are talking about with the other example, yep, which is very important. So some mass extinctions, um, like KT wiped out, the freshwater things did pretty well. Right? Why is that? Right. So thinking about how there's this selective bias and what effect it would have later is really important. It's good. What sort of selective biases do you think would happen if it were, you know, asteroid hitting the Earth? What would be selected for surviving? Yeah, I mean, well, one thing that happened, they think, is, I mean, fires, but also um, giant dust cloud that then blocks solar energy for a while, right? So would that make the Earth cooler and a lot less photosynthetic energy, right? So what would that select for? Mm hmm Yep, so what sort of traits would that be? Mm -hmm. Yep. Living in a hot vent, you mean notice what's happened. Right. Yeah. Hey, there's more stuff falling down I can eat. Great. Good. What else? Why do you say that? The birds. Well, post KT, yeah. yeah. Yep. Birds, let me think. Uh, I forget what, no, what the bats evolved later. Um, the pterosaurs bought it. Um, but insects did well. Well, insects did well. So, yeah. What else? What sort of selection pressures would that, or what sort of traits would be selected for by asteroid hitting in global winter? Okay, why? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, like mammals, it came to win. Um, also birds, right? Efficient Tuna. Efficient. Okay, why? Because if you're losing most of the ball of photosynthetic ability, you've only got a limited amount of resources. If you're a more large, multi center organism, mm -hmm. consuming uh, the energy, then they're not going to be producing energy. They're not going to be growing. Mm -hmm. So you kind of really, you got to make what you have last until things are broken. Yep, good. It's worse strategies for that. Hibernation. Mm -hmm. Hibernation. Actually, ectothermy, right? So it's kind of interesting because being able to regulate your temperature would be adaptive. But on the other hand, you know, we're constantly burning calories just to stay warm, right? We've had a snake here, like, hey, I'm the temperature I am, cool. Right? And not waste energy for that. And so, one question could be, one hypothesis could be, you know, who's right? Was endothermy selected for or selected against after, after the KT? Right? And that would be a cool scientific hypothesis. I don't know if anyone's actually worked on that. Right? You guys generated that. It's pretty cool. How would, how would, you, how would you test that? I 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, we, you can't like you know starve a squirrel and see how it does. Yeah. I don't think there is a specific answer. Just because in the ones more adequately equipped, it's going to lose the battle. We still have the cold blooded and thermoregulated. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's not something where it's it's either or. It's like this is like they might have a ten percent higher chance or a fifty percent higher chance, but not one hundred percent. Right. Um, but one thing you can do, I mean, one sort of dumb something, and this has some biases and stuff. But one thing you could do is just look at the species living before the KT and after the KT, and see the proportion of ectotherms to endotherms pre and post. And if endothermy is better, you just see a huge increase in uh, an increase in endotherms. Right. Now there's problems with that because endotherms might also have other traits that might be mammals. And so maybe just being a mammal is good because you make milk for your offspring. Right. So it could be that trait rather than endothermy. So you have to do there's ways to control for that, which we'll talk about later. But that sort of way of going back and saying, okay, here's my hypothesis, go back and look at the data to test it, is the way we do a lot of macroevolutionary biology. Right. So it's not you know starving squirrels, because oftentimes the time scale is too too long too. We can go back and say, I predict this about the world. And I can go and check, you know, my fossil history and see if it's matched by my prediction. Because even though you can't do direct manipulation experiments, you can sort of make predictions about what, what, the, what you should be able to see in your data and go get the data to test it. It's still experimental in that way. Right, so you could look at survivorship after KT. The one problem with that is that the conditions now might be different. So it, it's, it's, that would be saying, you know, is endothermy better in general rather than is endothermy better during the KT extinction band? So the time heterogeneous thing, but yeah. Yeah? So what about like fungi? Uh, so um, like when they die, you have people who have gotten beers from like hundreds of years ago. Yep, so the resting phase, so rather than like, so like hyperization, but, for, but like, you know, spores like can stay in, in that environment. So like um, anthrax is a great example where you can bury something that has anthrax, come back, and 10 years later dig it up and get anthrax. Um, fungal spores, seed banks are important. Yeah, all those sorts of things. They've just, a couple years ago, they got a bacterium that was stuck inside a salt crystal. And it's been there for millions of years. And they got out of salt crystal and let it grow, and it grew slowly and poorly, but it was alive. Time capsule. Lost world, but bacteria. <laughs> Good. What, what, what else would be selected for? How about what you eat? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but there's probably not. A lot, I mean, there's not a lot of like if think of like terrestrial organisms, like we get very little energy from some synthetic things, if any. Right. So I mean, photosynthesis is the base of the terrestrial food pyramid, at least, and we know that you know some some. Plants survive and some animals survive and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. And so that's another hypothesis that specialization on something tends to increase extinction rate, especially during mass extinctions. Right. If you're really good at eating, you know, just pronghorn antelope and they go extinct. Good luck to you, right? Because if you can eat 
you know, a slow pronghorn, but also berries and also um, grubs and logs and stuff like that, you might do that. Good. And so you might tend to also think about the thing about ecology, so a collapse of food chains to go and like lop off the high, most, highest most levels and have a more generalist interface. What other groups think about for what would happen after mass extinction? I didn't hear from every group, so I will wait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get knocked all the way back to unicellularity. I think I'll get back up. Yeah. That actually is an interesting question about like how long things take to evolve, and I think that's what lag time is important. So who knows what R versus K species are? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's coming from logist logistic growth, right? And so, right, so you can, you know, be a codfish and produce 10,000 eggs, and they're cheap things to produce them. That might be better than have, being a panda that you know has one baby at a time and half time sits on it and kills it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> right. And even though you know theoretically you can take better care of that baby and give it lots of nutrients, right? It's only better off just you know play the odds, produce lots of cheap offspring. Yeah, good. What else? Yeah, we usually don't think of biogeography in this context, but it is interesting. I mean, if it were just like the meter hit, I mean, you might have a sea level change and then goes back down. But, 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 but it could be if you had glaciation happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could have, I mean, global winter causes more glaciation, causes sea level fall, causes, causes more instances. That, that'd be interesting. Yeah. I mean, anyone's ever thought about that. Um, and we do see that biodiversity does matter. So, for example, when South America connected with North America, right, South America was this isolated thing, sort of like Australia, right? Isolated, lots of, lots of marsupials, connects, and things are going back and forth. Right? So we have giant terror birds coming north, and then we have llamas and horses going south. Or camelids going south. Let's see what, you know, what happens as a result of that. Good. All right, any questions about today? Just remember the big points were you know, learning sort of the big basic history of life, um, some of the high points, and making hypotheses. And so you see how people generate hypotheses in macroevolution and how you can sort of test some of them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.